impressed me was no matter how infirm or difficult their, how infirm they were or difficult their life was, how dignity mattered to them. And they were not well treated, sadly, on this particular occasion when I was in there. Um, and so this poem is really about the desire for life, the wish for life. <coughs> Three old ladies. Beaks open. Magic cracks like eggshell in their dry throats. Three marsh birds spit blood at hospital sheets. At night, their ghosts clatter, given life in the breath of old women. In the day, they sit, each at their own bedside, visiting themselves over and over. As long as death does not call in his unbeatable, terrible voice, their unfleshed bones may snap beneath their sugar paper. Their lights are pinched in the fingers of dark that are putting them out. They will use that last green twig to keep that light burning, or it is all for nothing. I also wrote a poem for each of the ladies, and I'm just going to read one of them. Um, and she did swear, the swear words aren't mine. Frances. <clears throat> Haired like Beethoven, she would never have heard of him. Her cry was a heron, mud stuck and staring up at the ceiling. Her hands, each like a small, separate child, dropped things. I would collect them for her. The spoon from the soup or the tissues when her blown nose had filled the sheeting. Her nurse cry was indignant, surprised at her need. Representatives of her state and the only means by which she moved from bed to chair, from sleep to sleep, she called on their duty her smell hanging like a damp flag, and they didn't fucking know the meaning of the word help. Every movement caused the knot that locked her two knees together to drag pain from her twisted hip. Each job, another tooth pulled, each tooth from a mouth a mile wide, too big to see each side. I found out her real fear when she asked for my help, because there was a picnic with children two hours ago. Where were they now? And this bed was the wrong one. Which one should she sleep in? <coughs> and the tap dripped in a bathroom I could not reach. In her sleep, she woke and could walk. It was full of people she knew once. Their laughter slapped the walls of our white room like a hand clap. And the nurses with their soup and their pain and their ground down powders should have been the dream. She smiled at me, spoke my name, eyes as big as the glass balls that were her spectacles, before she slept again. Um, this is a poem that actually is about my father, and it's odd because when I wrote it, um, I thought that I was writing a poem about um, the legacy that my mother had left in being that Hughes thing that, that just kind of gained its own momentum and became a thing. Um, and so I thought of my mother rather sort of leading him with it, you know, like a basket of shopping, here it is, and then leave it, you know, running. When he read it, he thought that I'd written a poem about me um, because the, the idea of um, comparing a poet to a penguin, which I do in this poem, and the skewers that eat penguin eggs to the knitters, um, as in France, when they were beheading noblemen and women. Um, you know, that thing of watching somebody, watching some gruesome unfolding, and you're sitting there with your knitting needle, and I was thinking, well, the skewers are a little like the electric quarters, I think they were called. And um, so this is my poem about my father. This is the poem that my father thought was about me, and maybe he's right. Bird. Pert as a penguin sat in his snow cold, nursing the egg his wife had left him. There it was, born of them both, like it or not, rounded in words and cracking open its shell for a voice. In the blizzard, beaten up from the Arctic flats, were the audience. From the glass extensions of their eyes, they watched the skewers rise on the updraft. Every snap of their beaks, like the tick of a knitting needle, hitching a stitch in the weight for a rolling head. I think you've got the point, really. And it's really interesting because sometimes people do 
really see something that you simply didn't mean to put there. And sometimes it really works. Sometimes it's a little bizarre, and we'll come to more of that later. And this is when I have to kind of lean over and get water, so excuse the indignity of The stone picker is the character I created for the worst of all of us uh, as women. I've also created another character called Stunkle, who's the worst of us as men. And it's nice because you can, you can meet terrible people and, and lots of different terrible people, and you can stuff all their worst aspects into these characters <laughs> and know that the characters aren't these terrible people, but actually they're a good representation. And Stone Picker has a very simple premise to begin with. She um, doesn't know forgiveness or accept responsibility. Everything that's bad in her life is your fault, and she's going to make you pay. Stone Picker. She is scooped out and bow-like, as if her string has been drawn tight. But really, she is plucking stones from the dirt for her shoulder bag. It is her dead albatross, her cross, her choice. In it lie her weapons. Each granite spear or sea-worn flint has weight against your sin. You cannot win. She calls you close, but not to let you in. Only for a better aim. I read that at one reading, and afterwards a woman came up to me and grabbed my arm, and she said, I had no idea you knew my sister-in-law so well. 